right, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Genesis. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, whether you're new, you've been around for a little bit. My name is Dan, and I get to serve as the groups and outreach pastor around here. But today, I also get to kick off our new teaching series on the parables of Jesus. And this is going to take us all the way through the summer. Now, whether you're new to church in general or you've been around for a really long time, you probably know some parables already, even if you've never even heard the word. But like the video just said, a parable is defined, at least by James Boyce, as a story taken from real life from which we can draw moral and spiritual truths. And when we look at the stories that Jesus told in the Gospels about a lost sheep and a runaway son and this helpful Samaritan, we see that these are just some of his most well-known parables that he ever taught. But if we look through all four of the Gospels, we realize that there are at least 27 different parables recorded for us on a wide array of topics from salvation to wisdom to what living life today is supposed to look like, even to life after death. And this method of teaching wasn't specific to Jesus, though. And uh, a, lot of rab- a lot of rabbis and teachers of the day used parables as a way to illustrate a point in, in their lesson or a lesson as a whole, and they were designed so that people would go with them, that they would stick in people's minds so that they would retell them and talk to their families about them and the people they worked alongside to really dig to find the point. But a lot of scholars who are both Jewish and Christian realize and admit that there's something different about Jesus's parables. They're, they're more complex, they're more sophisticated, and honestly, they're just more rich. There's something different about him, and be, it's because his were the best. And so this summer, we're going to look at several different parables that Jesus taught, and you're going to get to hear from different teachers who will go back and forth between our two campuses. So next week, I'll be over at Noblesville, and our lead pastor, Paul Muma, will be over here teaching on a different parable. And we're bound to learn a lot over the summer. But our prayer is that these parables will do what they were always intended to do. Show us and teach us what it means to live like Jesus, to be more like Jesus, because he's our model. He is the perfect example of what it means to be the people of God living in the kingdom of God. And I think a lot of us would agree that when we look around the world today or we flip through headlines on our phones, it doesn't seem like there's a lot going on that fits within that title, the kingdom of God. Things seem out of place. And so whether it's ongoing wars, uh, <clears throat> divided communities, divided countries, broken homes, or neglected children, it can often feel like everything is just spiraling out of control. And isn't this a great way to kick off summer, right? Like, congratulations, everything's getting worse. Like, that's what the news should say. Like, everything's just getting worse out there. But my hope for today is that as we look at this story about patience, all of us will start to see God's character more clearly in the that will lead us to a place of greater confidence and hope in him, in his plans, and his goodness. Today we're looking at the parable of the weeds from Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew 13, uh, there are multiple parables that Matthew has arranged. And the one we're going to look at comes right in the middle. But before we jump into our text, because of the complexity of Jesus' parables, I think it's important that we pause to pray. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the words of your son. And thank you for the the complexity and the depth of the parables that he told. I pray that right now, Lord, your spirit will move in this place and that will uh, free our minds and our hearts from distractions and that will tune our hearts to the key of your ear or tune our hearts to the key of your voice so that we can be drawn into a deeper relationship with you so we can understand your character even better. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray, amen. Now, this parable we're about to look at, I wanna give you a heads up that it is very layered. And there's a lot going on in it. And we only have a certain amount of time. So we're going to step in close and just look at some 
of the details today. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app with you, go ahead and make your way to Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The end. Sounds nice and clear, right? No, not at all. It's really confusing because we live in a very different time in a very different context from when Jesus originally told this story. So if we're going to understand it, if we're going to wrestle this, we need to at least try to understand this from a first century Jewish perspective perspective. Because the crowd who Jesus told this to were people who, at least compared to you and I, lived much closer to their food. They understood the incredibly hard work that would go into cultivating Middle Eastern ground to produce a crop. And so when Jesus starts off his story about a guy who owns a field, who planted some good seed, immediately everyone listening knew the work that went into it. They knew the time of year. They knew every step that had to be taken, every task that had to be done. And it likely even brought memories and images to every one of their minds. It was a relatable, tangible picture of everyday life in first century Israel. And then with the second sentence, Jesus introduces this unnamed antagonist. And let's be honest, we love a quality villain, don't we? Like every good book or movie or story or play or anything has a quality villain to it. Just try to think of one that you enjoy that doesn't have that. I mean, who would Harry Potter be if there was no he who shall not be named, right? And who would Batman be if there was no Joker? And who among us? would have any clue who Kevin McAllister is if it wasn't for these two jokers. The purpose of a quality antagonist is to bring tension to a story. And that tension brings the reality of conflict and struggle to the forefront of our minds. And that is exactly the the reason that Jesus introduced this unnamed enemy to create that point of tension, to create the conflict, to draw people in to the reality of what he was about to teach. And look at what this enemy did in verse 25. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now, this doesn't seem particularly heinous, does it? But it's not like this guy showed up in the middle of the night and just like blowing dandelion seeds into this guy's field. No, if we're going to understand this, we need to understand that these were harmful weeds. Some translations call the weeds tares, but they're commonly referred to today um, as uh, as the name bearded darnel. And as they grow, they look almost exactly like wheat. Take a look at this picture. This is a picture taken of a wheat field in Israel. And in this field, we have both good wheat and the exact kind of weeds that Jesus was talking about. As you look at that field, can any one of you distinguish the good from the bad? Can you tell what's wheat and what's weeds? I mean, I can't, but I can barely tell the difference between dandelions and thistles and the other plants that are just around my house. So there's no way I'll be able to distinguish anything that's growing in this picture. But if you look at this picture, you can start to see some differences. The weeds are on the left and the wheat is on the right. And there are two main differences between these two plants. And it's easier to tell them once they've reached maturity. 
because the two main differences come in the kernels that they produce. The weeds here on the left produce dark black kernels compared to the light brown kernels of the wheat at the time of harvest. The other distinguishing piece is that the kernels from the weeds are poisonous. And so as this unnamed enemy shows up and starts sowing these weeds into somebody's field, it's not like he was just attacking somebody's business. It was an assault on this landowner's livelihood and his life and the life of his family. And in some instances, even the health and livelihood of the whole community at large. And so when we think about it from that perspective, we realize the severity of what this enemy did. He deliberately sowed poison into someone's crop. And if this sounds a little too dramatic to be true, I want to point out that this was such a big deal in the first century that Rome created specific laws prohibiting this very thing. This type of action was not tolerated in any community. And as Jesus goes on telling his story, the wheat starts to sprout and eventually grows heads and the weeds are doing the same thing, but they've already taken root and now it's all intermingled together. And it's that point when the servants who are in charge of taking care of the field come along and say, hey, uh, sorry to bother you, but we know you planted good seeds, so... Where did all of this come from? Where did all these weeds come from? Because they, like us, expect that when you sow good seed, you're only going to get a good quality, healthy crop. And so their question is more of of an acknowledgement that something has gone wrong, that things just aren't the way they're supposed to be. And all of us, at some point in our life, have to come to grips with that very thing. That things just don't seem right. We read about the good world that God created and then we look around and it's like, we just, we feel the tension of something's not right here. And as good gardeners and farmers know, it's important to get rid of the weeds. But the plot twist in the story is that the landowner told them, not to pull them out because it will damage the wheat. But instead he tells them that when the time is right, the kernels of wheat will be separated from the poisonous imitation and both will be dealt with accordingly. And that's where it ends. There's no resolution. This enemy isn't brought to justice. There's just this statement that eventually everything will be taken care of. And this leads us to a really important point about parables. They are mysteries to be pondered, not puzzles to be solved. In our Western mindset, we like to be able to categorize and explain every part of a story. We like to decipher its meaning and move on because most of us aren't okay with unresolved conflict in a story. We like to know that the enemy was brought to justice and that everybody lives happily ever after. But ancient Near Eastern people were okay with the tension created by parables. They saw mysteries as a wonder to behold because they knew that these parables were meant to be retold and retold and retold and talked about again and again and again with, you, with their kids, with their spouses, with their communities, with the people they worked next to. And so we can't expect to read a parable, decipher its meaning, and just move on. Jesus' parables are far too complex and sophisticated for us to be able to do that. And compared to other rabbis and teachers of his day, his were on a whole nother level. And because of that, we need to revisit them and we need to wrestle with what they mean. And as we continue to meditate on Jesus' words, it creates, it creates space in us for the Holy Spirit to do the work, to show us what it means to be the people of God in a hurting world. And to be honest with all of you, this parable over the last couple weeks has messed me up. 
I was talking to my men's group about this the other day. And like, I have read this parable, read about this parable, prayed about it, read it again, read more about it, prayed about it again. And it's got me upside down and inside out because every time I think I have a clear understanding of this is the point that you want me to get from this God. Another question is stirred in me from the Holy Spirit and it gets me looking at it from a different perspective and the whole mental wrestling match starts over again. But fortunately for me, the disciples, and for you, but the disciples were as confused as any of us. And so they asked Jesus for an explanation. Look at verse 36. Then he, Jesus, left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. So here we have it. Clear meaning of all the different characters in the parable laid out by Jesus. The landowner is the son of man. And that's a title that comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel that is used about the promised Messiah who is Jesus. The field is the world or all of creation, really. The good seeds are the people of God's kingdom who have submitted to his lordship and are living accordingly. The enemy is the devil. And I think we all saw that one coming, right? The poisonous weeds are everything that causes sin and the people who align themselves with the enemy. And the harvest, well, that's the end of the age. That's the time when Jesus will return to restore his creation. And the harvesters are the angels. See, this parable, while set in a first century context, really illustrates all of history. The very first pages of the Bible make it clear that God created a good world. He did the work to create his good world, similar to how a landowner does the work to cultivate a good and healthy field. And then God sowed his image-bearing people into the world so that they could care for it and they could partner with him to accomplish his plans. But by page three, of the Bible, the enemy comes along and starts sowing poison into God's creation. And by convincing, sorry, by introducing ways contrary to what God commanded and convincing humans that, uh, convincing humans to define right and wrong according to our own standards. Because of those actions, evil was able to take root in our world. And ever since that moment, Weeds and wheat have been growing alongside one another in God's world. And when we look at the parable from this perspective, we're reminded that evil is foreign to God's good world. It is a poisonous intruder. And we don't have to look very far to see the effects of these weeds in creation, do we? Some of them are really obvious, but some of them are more subtle. And some of them are so subtle that they're evil disguised as good. And when we're confronted with the problem and the reality of evil in the world, we ask like the servants, where did all of this come from? Why is all of this still happening? And sometimes those questions are the result of an injustice that we hear about that takes place somewhere else in the world, but sometimes it's the result of our own experience with suffering. And these questions force us to ask questions of ourself and questions of God. And these are the events that catch us off guard because we all tend to think that if we follow Jesus, everything will go nice and smooth. But Jesus himself warned us that in this world, we will have trouble. He also told us that the enemy comes only to seek, to kill and destroy. And one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, compared the devil to a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so when the consequences of living alongside poisonous weeds hit, we're forced to ask the questions, the hard questions about what we believe 
And we have to decide if we really believe that God is both entirely good and completely sovereign over all of creation. Klein Snodgrass says, this parable shows that alongside the power of the king, another power, an illegitimate power is at work. But it's vital that we remember that this illegitimate power is by no means equal or even close to the power of the king. Look at how Jesus continues his explanation. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Here's the thing about parables. Sometimes explanations make us more uncomfortable than the tension created by the parable itself. Or at the very least, it starts to bring up more questions. And this complex parable indicates that the kingdom is present despite the evil we see in the world. And it emphasizes that the kingdom of God will continue to grow because these weeds cannot choke it out. So as small as the kingdom of God may seem at times and as powerful as evil may seem, we can know that the kingdom will continue to grow. And this also emphasizes that a day is coming when good and bad seeds will be separated at a time of judgment. And for a lot of us, that makes us really uncomfortable because generally we don't like the idea of being judged. But without judgment, there is no salvation. Because without judgment, there is no difference between good wheat and poisonous weeds. Without judgment, there's no difference between good and evil. And what we need to remember is that responsibility does not belong to a single one of us. It belongs to God alone. Because it's impossible for you or me to be able to discern what's going on in another person's heart when we can't even tell the difference between literal wheat and weeds. But Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. And similar, in the book of Jeremiah, God himself says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. Because he is the only one who can do that. He is the only one who can make an honest distinction between good, healthy wheat and poisonous weeds. You see, the landowner said to wait because he had a plan to deal with the weeds. And so God wants us to trust in his timing and trust in his plan because he is the one who is able to tell the difference. Now, there's loads of good news in this parable too. Okay, so like you can smile, you can sit up a little bit. I know it's been a little heavy. But if you have submitted your life to Jesus, you are one of the good seed. Because when someone chooses to honestly follow Jesus and live according to his standards, it's a choice to not align with the enemy. But, and this is one of the questions that came to my mind over the last couple weeks, wheat has to grow. So what's the point of wheat? Well, wheat, like any other plant, the per- its purpose is to grow to a point of maturity that it produces more good seed. And that's what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. It means that as you follow, it means you commit to following him. And that as you follow him, you let him transform who you are. And that as he transforms you, you begin to live on mission for him in every area of your life. Nothing is off limits. Being a disciple of Jesus is an active process. That doesn't mean that it's all about the work that you put in to grow, but it means that you choose every single day to follow his ways, to define right and wrong by his standards and not your own. 
And that ability to choose that comes from, that comes from knowing him and knowing his ways. That's why meditating on his word, getting his word into the depths of your being is so important. Because as you meditate on it, as you continue to roll it over in your mind and in your heart, and as you process it with other followers, it creates good ground inside of you for the Holy Spirit to, do, to bring about a healthy crop. This parable also, I told you there are layers upon layers here, but this parable also teaches us about God's character. Because in it, we see that God loves his creation so much that he is committed to dealing with evil. Even though evil is present, there will be a day when God will remove the invasive weeds from his good field. And as harsh as that may sound, this is an act of his justice that is born out of his grace and out of his love. And because God is just, he will not allow evil to poison his good creation forever. And so if we are, if you are a follower of Jesus, we look forward to the day when he will return to restore creation to his intended design. There's a tension that we feel in that sometimes, isn't there? David Guzik said, sometimes people think they must balance God, supposing there is something like a yin and a yang to the universe in the sense of a light and dark, good and evil, law and grace. But God himself is unbalanced in this sense. He is entirely good. Even his justice and power and wrath must be understood as aspects of his goodness. And in his goodness... God has already initiated the coming of his kingdom through the life of Jesus. And he has sealed the victory of his kingdom through Jesus' death and resurrection. And if we can trust in his unchanging goodness, then we don't need to understand why God lets evil exist in the world. We can take him at his word and we can believe that he is good and we can know that in time he will bring about his plans. See, because God is good, he is also patient. The apostle Peter wrote in his second letter, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. While it may appear that God is working slowly, God is never slow about his promise. His delay is an indication of his patience because God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but in mercy, he gives each of us, time to repent. See, it may not feel like it in your life or when you look at the state of the world, but God is in control. He always has been and always will be. And this is part of his character that we call his sovereignty. It means nothing surprises him and no one is equal to him. And because he is good, he is patiently waiting for the right time for Jesus to return, giving as many people as possible the opportunity to find salvation in him. Because that is the only place where we can find it. The God who reigns over all of creation desires a personal relationship with each of us. desires to see his image bearing seed come to know him to reflect his character into his creation because it's only by his grace that weeds can become wheat and it's only by his goodness that wheat can thrive among poisonous weeds 
pray with me? God Almighty, Lord of creation, God, we are in awe of your character. And until we see you face to face, we will never fully understand the depths of your love or your goodness. But we are so grateful for both of those. We are so grateful that you show us how good you are through the through your son, through the person of Jesus. So God, we, we praise you and we worship you for that, for the fact that you alone can take a sinner like me and turn me from poisonous weeds into good and healthy weed. And so God, I pray that as we go about our days, as we go into our weeks, Lord, that you keep this parable turning over and over and over in our minds and in our hearts to draw us into a deeper relationship with you, to show us the ways that we can reflect your character to those around us. God, we love you. We praise you for your goodness. We trust you because your character is unchanging. It's in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.